The United States has the most school shootings in the world by far. The publication Education Week counted 23 in the first half of this year, resulting in 13 people killed. And the violence at some U.S. schools doesn't stop even during summer break. In the city of Memphis, Tennessee, police shot and arrested a man who tried to break into a Jewish school and fired several shots outside the building. No one but the shooter was injured. Police say he was a former student at the school. The state with the most school shootings this year is Texas. To address this, the governor has mandated extra armed guards and other safety measures, but some want Texas to tighten its gun control laws too. DW met with students in Houston. I'm Asi Ardawatia. I'm Sami Beg. I'm Caroline Dalewski. My name is Jay Love. In Houston, Texas, we meet four high school students and active members of the March for Our Lives movement, a student-led advocacy group fighting for better gun laws. Like many around the U.S., they have demands that they believe creates a safe classroom environment. I would say if we were to do three wishes, um, the first prong of those wishes would be a universal background check. Raising the age of firearm purchase from 18 to 21 is essential for this issue. I do support banning assault rifles. Not only are students, but teachers are concerned. Dallas-based arts teacher Katrina Rasmussen believes that current safety precautions are not enough. And without gun control, it's only a matter of time until the next school shooting. I feel like um, we're playing Russian roulette. I think it's only a matter of time. I don't think that the safety measures we have in place are enough to prevent something from happening. In a sense, it's like security theater. In response, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed a new security mandate law. Schools statewide need to have an armed police officer on staff. They also need to add new infrastructure to slow down any potential intruder. We must establish the safest standards. We cannot let another school year go by without making our schools safer. On the outskirts of Dallas, several teams from a nationwide window security film installation company are getting ready to integrate some of these measures. The company's CEO, James Beal, explains what his company is doing. We demonstrate that in our... So right now, uh, we are installing, prepping the windows and installing a dual-function solar security film for forced entry mitigation, right? So what we call delay. So we're trying to delay people entering uh, the windows. This is also part of the state mandate for the state of Texas. Supporters of the governor's new law believe that increasing security in and outside school campuses will help to prevent the next shooter. Beal sees his company as being a small but critical part of the solution. Because at the end of the day, the, the data is there. Doors and glass doors are the weak spot in schools and that's what's being breached. Some of the students in Houston still believe that Governor Abbott failed to meet the students' needs and has to readjust his focus and create a safe environment. When you bring in these school fortification measures that make your schools such like hostile and really scary places to be, they're not safe, they're not, they don't feel safe, they don't feel comfortable, it doesn't bring comfort. Hopefully, school shootings are a thing of the past. The sooner, the better. They all agree that time is on their side to bring real change to America when it comes to school safety. Justin Heinze is an associate professor of health behavior and health education and co-director of the National Center for School Safety at the University of Michigan. Welcome to the day. What do you make of the Texan approach to school safety? Yeah, I, we work with schools around the United States, and I, I feel like this is a common reaction to a school shooting, is you see this real investment in physical security, which I, I think intuitively is going to make buildings safer. But at least from a research perspective, from a practitioner perspective, there isn't a lot of data to support target hardening or physical security strategies as a way to prevent school shootings. So I, I think these mitigation efforts, while they could be effective, uh, we just don't know. Uh, what we can say with a fair amount of certainty is the student at the end of the, the video uh, mentioned the, the fear. Students notice mm. when there are physical security measures. They notice when there are cameras or metal detectors or armed security professionals. And that creates an environment that I'm not sure is conducive to learning. Yeah, what does that do to young people to live in constant fear of becoming a victim of gun violence? 
I, I think it promotes a salience for learners. They realize that there are these, these measures in place. And when they're noticing those sorts of security measures, they're not paying attention to their studies, their reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, we see with schools where there are a lot of visible security measures, there can be increased absenteeism, um, there can be concerns about uh, their safety, there can be uh, uh, some trauma experience when students who, for example, have negative relationships with police officers or students who have experienced uh, firearm or gun violence in the past are reminded that these things are possible. And what's mm -hmm. sort of sad is when you look at schools as a whole, for young people, they're actually pretty safe places to be. Yes, violence does occur in school, but by and large, when you look at other environments, schools are generally safe places. And so I think that there is a risk when we only focus on some of those very visible security measures and not doing some of the evidence-based practices that we know can promote safer schools. And that would be things like promoting uh, school climate, restorative practices, behavioral threat assessment. These all have a nice body of literature and data to support their efficacy at actually preventing violence. Um, rather than some of these measures that, yes, they're very visible, yes, intuitively they might make sense, like creating a, a, a bulletproof glass or um, detection measures, but we just don't know if they're actually going to be effective. Yeah. There has been a dramatic spike in school shootings in recent years. Is there an explanation to that? I, I wish I had an explanation for why we're seeing such an increase. And you're right, over the past three to five years, we've seen school shooting incidents uh, rise from around 20 to 30 uh, across the United States to now over 100. And the severity of the school of the shootings that we're seeing within schools is increasing as well in terms of the number of injuries and fatalities. And I do not have that explanation. And one of the most confounding things here is that other measures of violence within schools, and those would be things like physical fights or bullying behavior or students saying that they don't feel uh, safe in school. Over the past decade or 15 years, those have been steadily decreasing. So we have this one very troublesome measure of violence that's increasing, while many other indicators of violence in and around schools are, are decreasing. So a lot of our attention now is to think, uh, to try to think specifically about gun violence in particular. And what is it about gun violence that could be increasing? It is a still a very rare event, thankfully, within U.S. schools, um, but it does happen, and that increasing frequency means it needs more attention. Yeah, we only have about a minute left, but I do want to get into how to break this cycle. Meaningful legislation doesn't seem to be an option right now, unfortunately. So what can be done? Well, for us, we do point to a school programming that does seem to work. We're thinking about schools and school safety in a comprehensive way. So there's not a panacea. There's not just one program that's going to make schools safe. We think schools need to be combining multiple efforts and thinking about the whole gamut of school safety. So these would be prevention activities. That could be things like identifying students that are at risk to begin with or threat assessments again they're trying to engage students we think about things that are happening at the time of an incident so what are some of those mitigation strategies like uh, that we're mentioning in the video what are some of the things at the time of incident that could reduce the number of injuries that are happening and then one thing that i think is really important that schools can sometimes overlook are the recovery strategies if a school has a serious violent event, how are we going to support those school communities moving forward? And our job is to continue to develop that evidence base to support those activities. That was Justin Heinze of the University of Michigan. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And for more on this, we can speak to David Reedman. He's the founder of the K-12 School Online Shooting Database, which contains information about school shootings in the U.S. since 1966. And he joins us now from Orlando in Florida. Thanks so much for your time, David. Uh, can we start with the frequency of school shootings uh, in the last decades? I mean, has it been a steady increase since the 1960s? Yeah, looking at more than 2,400 incidents back to 1966, what has really changed in the last five years is the number of incidents that are occurring. And not only their frequency, but when there are planned attacks at schools, they're becoming more deadly. Okay, so the last five years have been 
particularly bad. Now, if we look at Texas, it's got one of the most relaxed gun laws in the US. People over the age of 21 don't need a license to carry a gun, I believe. Can you explain to us how politicians justify this complete lack of gun control when shootings keep happening and, as you say, are getting worse in the last few years? Yeah, the, the limitless gun control is based on an interpretation of the Constitution that uh, people are allowed to carry guns by any means in any place. And it's very difficult to uh, dissuade people that, that take that viewpoint on it. Yeah, I mean, we, we heard in that report, didn't we, these sort of suggested uh, countermeasures, I think sort of security film on windows, armed guards in schools are becoming a reality. Um, I mean, are these now actively being implemented? And more importantly, are they not more of a, a Band-Aid rather than a solution to the actual problem? Yeah, they really are a Band-Aid. And in many cases, they may not be successful at all in preventing an attack or saving lives. Because one trend over the last 10 years is that more and more shootings are occurring outside of the school building. So most shooters are current or former students who are familiar with the school. They understand the security procedures. They understand the different time periods when people are gonna be moving in and out of the schools, in and out of classrooms. And that means that that person is going to be able to target the most vulnerable time and place at the school. So adding a fortified entryway, adding glass windows or uh, ballistic windows, that's ineffective if the person either knows how to get into the building or knows how to target students when they're outside of those defenses. We heard, again, in the report, students saying that these kind of measures just make the schools feel scary and uncomfortable places. And yet we know that gun regulations are, are generally unpopular in the US, especially in uh, Republican states. Do you think that any change is at all likely in gun policy on a federal level in the near future, just, you know, given the number of shootings that are happening? It's unlikely that there are changes at the federal level. Uh, but what we do need to realize is that School shootings are not random, and when they are predictable attacks, they're preventable. So somebody who's going to uh, commit a school shooting makes overt warnings for weeks or months or even years before an attack. And what we need to do is set up systems where students and staff members and community members are able to recognize somebody who's in trouble and know how to take action to get help for that person before a shooting occurs. David Reedman, founder of the K-12 School Online Shooting Database, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for talking to us on DW. Thank you so much.